I tell you what, I am, uh, allow me, I'll just let you stay seated this morning because we're going to move through Scripture rather quickly. Got a lot to cover today. Amen. We've been, uh, last week, tremendous Easter day. Amen. Both services from here and the one in New Caney was, was full. We had put out chairs in both places. That, that's a good thing. And I knew it would be that way. But I'm blessed to see so many back in church today, so many guests with us. Amen. As we move forward, uh, I love church. I just love church, man. I, I, I've had this kind of week where I just couldn't wait to get here and be in this house with my friends, my family, amen, to be encouraged, and then just to be able to preach the Word. And I've been preaching this Word since Wednesday, amen. I've been sharing it with other people, my pastor, uh, any, anybody that listened to me, amen. I've been sharing with them. This means so much to me. I know we got Mother's Day coming up, and I thank God for all our moms and dads in here. But the, the bottom line, when I read this Scripture, and we talked about his resurrection last week, but we're going to back up now and regress just a little bit to pick up on some more of the sayings from the cross. These sayings changed my life. You know, I was a young believer of six months old in Tuscumbia, Alabama. Uh, you know, I'd only been saved about, uh, like I said, a few months, and I heard a man preach seven nights on seven sayings from the cross. Don't know what that was. It sounded like an old Curtis Mathis TV. Didn't it? Did it sound like that to you? For those that don't know who Curtis Mathis was, I don't know who he is either. I just know he created a very expensive TV. Is that right? So I mean, we had payments on it. We had payments on the TV, but not on the car. Dad drive an old car, but he wanted that TV. And it had a record player in it and, and other stuff that went on. So anyway, I know y'all having a little difficulty back there. Uh, so don't, I, I know where I'm going, so we'll get through it. All right, guys. Amen. But two things happen on the way to the cross. We know about the, the night in Gethsemane. We know about the guest chamber where Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, including Judas. We know Judas betrayed. He went out in the night. We understand Gethsemane, the place of pressure. The, uh, not my will, but thine be done. Three times Jesus said it. Then he goes into a trial. They beat him. They mock him. They spit upon him. Then he is led out early in the morning. He's had no sleep. His body's already drained from blood and sweat. Uh, we read of no liquid refreshment for him at all. Then we pick up on the spot where he's on his way, and a, a man named Simon carries the cross for him. And I thought to myself, and when I do these thinking, I think, wonder what Simon's life was like after he realized he carried the cross for Christ. Amen to and I don't believe, I do not believe that Jesus fell carrying the cross. I believe he embraced the cross. They removed it from him. They put it on something, maybe even a sense of a punishment because he came to embrace the cross. Can I get an amen? So the scripture says in Luke 23, 26, as they led him away, they see Simon from Cyrene who was on his way in from the country, put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. Did you know the scripture teaches us to carry our own cross? Amen. It teaches us that everybody in here has got a life and you got a cross. And a lot of the crosses you carry are from the choices we've made. Amen. And we just keep carrying those crosses and pressing. And sometimes we help other people carry their cross. I could stop right here and preach a message on carrying your own cross. We all got a cross to bear. We all, but our, the Scripture teaches that he helps carry our burdens. Can I get an amen? So he, he, he carried a cross, amen, died on the cross, left the cross, and then tells you, I'll help you carry your cross. Oh, what a God like that. Amen. Uh, amen. Long night, lack of sleep, trials, mockery, loss of blood in the garden, the scourge and the beating, and then the weeping of the women on his way there. What moves him? Man, what a song. What moves him? He sees women weeping on his way. He can't do anything for them other than give them information. How many know that information is powerful? Woo, if you got some info on what's coming ahead prophetically, you know it's coming, you better pay attention to it. Every now and then I'll hear somebody prophesy, and I know that something's coming down the road I need to pay attention to. Then other times I hear some folk prophesy. Oh, Amen. They, they, they think certain things are coming, and they're not coming. Amen. So I'll pay close attention to make sure whatever I hear lines up with the Word of God. Can you get amen? So a large number of people followed him, including women. They mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourself, for your children, for the time will come when you will say, blessed are the barren women. 
the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. And if men do these things when the tree is green, when things are good, what's going to happen when it is dry? And again, when I look at this, I realize they weep for him, but he said, don't, don't cry about me. And, and there are times in my life I want to say the same thing. You know, you know I've given God permission. Lord, whenever you're ready to take me, you take me. Amen. Don't, don't cry for me. It, th those that remain, you understand this is the land of sorrow. This is the land of suffering. This is the land of pain. But there's coming a day when we'll leave these earth suits. Hallelujah. And we'll be in a land of forevermore of joy. Can I get an amen? So in 70 AD, it happened. Amen. In 70 years after the death of Christ under Titus, there was a four-year lockdown. There were great atrocities. And mothers even turned on eating their own children. Amen. So he prophesied to them and gave them information. Don't weep about me. Weep for yourself. The timetable, when you understand the sayings on the cross, went like this. He was crucified at 9 a.m. He was taken down from the cross at 3 p.m. Six hours of extreme suffering there. The first three utterances demonstrated the love of God. And we've talked about these. The first one was a couple of weeks ago when he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. There are times I realize in life that I have done stuff that I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to justify it by saying, you know, the truth is I didn't know what I was doing. How many know there comes a time when you're too smart to get away with that one? But he looked down at them and said, you know what? They don't know what they're doing. They don't realize they're crucifying the Lord of glory. Amen. And then he asked God, his Father, forgive them. The second thing he said from the cross was the conversion. We mentioned it a while ago when there was a thief there that said to him, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I love this simply because it puts to light that baptism doesn't save us. I believe it's important to be baptized. Amen, in water, but it doesn't save us. Amen, it's a confession of faith, believing in Jesus, repenting of our sins. Amen. So, so he says, and it's soul sleep. Some people think when you die, you go into the ground and you stay there. That is a morbid thought. Amen, that I would be stuck inside a coffin as my body's decaying and my poor spirit's inside of a wooden box going, let me out. I don't believe in that. Amen. So people ask me all the time, well, the pastor, how is it that, that this thing's going to happen when the dead in Christ rise first? It's a mystery. Somebody say mystery. Have you ever watched mysteries? Amen. You don't know the end until you get to the end. We're not to the end yet. Amen. Evidently, we're coming back with him, getting back into these earth suits. God will glorify them, and then we get to fly. Talk about 300 miles an hour and a quarter. Amen. I guess we're going to get to do it. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. It's just a mystery. So I don't understand. I don't have to know it all to believe it. That's what faith is. Amen. I don't, I don't see it, but I know it's going to happen. Listen, Isaiah 53 says, therefore, I'll reward him extravagantly. Whew. When Jesus died on the cross and he forgave the, uh, the, the young man on the other side, the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. Wherever the Lord is, that's where I want to be. It's that, it's that simple. To be absent, Paul said, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So Isaiah, 1,000, 1,500 years before Jesus even showed up on earth, talking about prophetic, looking down the road, he said, I'll reward him extravagantly, the best of everything, the highest honors, because he looked death in the face and he didn't flinch. Because he embraced the company of the lowest. Anybody ever felt like you're the lowest? Amen. We watch the Hollywood extremes, and we watch the, the, uh, the athletic. Uh, um, <sighs> if I had the athletic ability and you would give me a million dollars, of course I'd play football, basketball, golf, whatever. Come on. Can I get an amen? And they act like they all that? Listen, uh, graduation's coming up. Have you realized how much we celebrate people that graduate that ain't done nothing yet? I won't say that in the next service, but I just want to say it here. <laughs> but we do. We celebrate people who ain't done nothing yet. It's not, you know, your hard work, you're not going to be known for that. You're going to be known for what you've left behind here, for how many people you touched here, for how many people you blessed here, hey, how many people you forgave here. Hey, Amen. That, that's what we're going to get known for. So he says, I, 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 he didn't flinch. He embraced the company of the lowest. He took on his own shoulders the sin of the many. He took up the cause of the black sheep. When I read that, I thought about my past. Raised up the grandson of bootleggers. 
had an outhouse as a kid, picked cotton as a boy. You don't get no more black sheep than to be ostracized from a community because your family sells liquor, illegal liquor, to all the Baptists. Can I get an amen? Black sheep. He took up the cause of the black sheep. I love that. Then this third saying, to be able to push himself up on that nail, to fill his lungs with air, there stood by the cross of Jesus, mama, and his mother's sister, which in Alabama makes that his aunt. We're not talking about Arkansas. Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved. What book we in? We in John. Amen. John always talking about, John, John, John was ostracized, picked on, maligned because he loved. But Jesus knew, if I'm going to give my mother custody to anybody out of these 11 knotheads I got left over, I ain't going to let her go with James. Now, he, he'll start a fight. Amen. I'm not going to let her go with Thomas. He'll keep doubting. I even said it at the cross. I'm going to give her over to John. So he looked from down from the cross. Amen. Seeing his mother, whom he loved, John, whom he loved. And he said unto his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. One translation says, accepted her as his own mother. When I read this, I realized that Jesus gave a commission. That, that commission is an instruction or a duty given to a person or a group of people. He instructed John, take care of mama. Amen. I can't do it anymore. What we understand probably is that Joseph is gone. But when I read these final words of a dying man, Amen. His, the, and again, the third saying is somewhere between 9 and 12 o'clock. And I think about family. Jesus was a family man. Not only gathered the disciples as a family, he loved his mama. Amen. His first miracle, he wasn't ready to do it, but mama asked him to. I mean, don't do what mama asked you to do. Amen. He turned the water into wine. So I think to myself, what, what is it makes a good family? I can be honest with you. And again, guys, it's not on the overhead, but commitment. Committing yourself to one another. Time together. Time together. Again, the, the joy I had just being with my two sons who I never get a chance. I, I say never, that doesn't happen. But I had a chance to be with these two boys. Amen. And go out to the races and hang out and get sunburned. Amen. But time together. If anything you do, spend time together. Amen. It's not what you spend on them. It's just some time together. And you'll look back. I saw a picture of an of a older man toting a hand, and I'm sure it was a father and a grandson. But on the father, it showed an hourglass. Have y'all seen that? And, on, and the hourglass on his back showed that he had a little bit of time left. And the hourglass on the little boy showed he had his whole life left. And that's how I feel when I'm around my grandkids and my kids in this church, that my time is running out. Amen. But they got lots of time. I want to pour my time, what I got left, into them. Can I get an amen? Somebody said that, that a family is a group of people who have keys to the same house. Others said that, that, that uh, strong families are, are people who go back to the same place after they're tired of being with other people. Got to get an amen? Communication. Good families have a way to communicate. How to share it, how to talk. Amen. A lady came to the, to, to the pastor and she said, I need some counseling. I said, What's going on? She said, I want a divorce. So, well, well why, do you, why do you want a divorce? Do you have any grounds? She said, Yeah, about nine acres south of Dayton. I said, No, no, I mean, do you have a grudge? She said, No, we don't, but we have a carport. Well, I said, Does he beat you up? She said, No, I'm usually the first one up in the morning. So why are you having trouble with your husband? Well, he just doesn't communicate. <laughs> Men and women communicate different, don't we? I've said this for years. Men's heads are full of boxes. They got a tackle box in their head, don't they, Tony? David got a tackle box. They got a box for their guns. They got a box in their head for their motorcycle and their boat. They got a box in their head for their job. 
They when they when they when they go to the job, they get into that box. When they leave that box, they head over to the next box. But man got a box. He got a box that that no. He, he got a box in the bottom of his head. And you're right. It ain't got nothing in it. It's a nothing box. A man can do something that a woman can never do. He can sit for hours and think of nothing. He can fish for hours and think of nothing. He can sit at the deer stand for hours and think of nothing. It drive a woman nuts. You know why? Because her head's a ball of wire. Everything in her head touches something else. It's the, the keys are connected to the kids. The kids are connected to breakfast that morning. Breakfast connected to what we're having for supper tonight. What I got to fix? I got to go to work. I got to fix this up. And it's just constantly going. Amen. Always running back and forth, back and forth. And she look at him going, Yo, will you pay attention to me? And he's in his nothing, Bob. He ain't thinking enough. Drive her nuts. Well, I come, I come home. And, and my day's been crazy. You know what? I don't want to talk about it. Sister Lori. I know, I know, I got to quit. I'll sit down, oh, and here's another thing. They say, ladies, I, I need y'all to understand this. Men invest. We invest. I know ladies do too. But if we're watching a football game and we're into three quarters of it and you come up and start talking to us and we've invested in that football game, Thank God for DVR. Thank God. I, I pause it, Sue. I pause it and sit there and listen. Save my marriage. Just listen. And when she's done, I smile, kick it back on. Y'all with the preacher right now? Huh? You know what I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about? Uh -huh. you, know what, you know what I'm talking about. You married? Okay. Thank you, Lord. Bible says you get trouble when you get married. That's what the Bible says. So learn the Bible. All right. Coping skills. You know, good families have coping skills. They learn how to deal with problems as they come. Amen. Problems always come. Every family has problems. Amen. The Chinese symbol for crisis also means opportunity. Every crisis I ever met becomes an opportunity to somehow to turn this thing around for the good. Can I get an amen? Amen. Your response is either going to break you or it's going to make you. Hallelujah. I, I, when I was coming up, I remember Dennis the Menace. Y'all remember Dennis the Menace? Hey, Amen. How many of y'all ever raised a Dennis the Menace? Uh-huh. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, oh Dennis, he, he's in the corner. He's in trouble again. He's getting lectured by his parents. And he looks at his parents. He said, you know, if y'all raising me right, how come I keep getting in so much trouble? In other words, his parents' fault. Can I get an amen? <laughs> y'all crazy? Woo. Hey, hey, listen. Kids who wanted to give their dad a family history book. And much to their dismay, one member of their family, Uncle George, was a real black sheep. Mm -hmm. He was electrocuted for a crime he committed. So they got a creative biographer who said, no problem. Here is what he wrote about Uncle George. I was with a man this week that worked over in Huntsville, that place where the chair is. Y'all know what I'm talking about? This is what he wrote. He said, Uncle George, he occupied a chair of applied electronics at an important government institution. He was attached to his position by the strongest of ties, and his death came as a real shock. That's learning how to cope. That's learning how to say something nice about somebody you shouldn't, wouldn't want to. And then just plain old spiritual health. Learning how to spiritually get together and connect with one another. Mary is his mother. He looks down from the cross and he sees her. In a sea of hate, there's one little area of love. Mama. You could see him at 33 reflecting back to his first miracle. To go back to when he was 12 and he was found in the temple preaching the word of God and sharing Isaiah chapter was that 60, 61, uh, where he says uh, about the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, where he came to, he anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. And he walks through that. I can see him going down memory lane as he's looking at his mother. Amen. She's older now. The years have passed. He's grown. She's a widow. We don't know about Joseph. The Bible just kind of, and I don't mean this mean, but sometimes when you're gone, out of sight, out of mind, and Joseph's gone now, amen, and 
somewhere between the time Jesus was 12 and the time of his ministry. Joseph seemed to drop off the scene, and Mary's alone, older, shoulders are stooped a little bit. There are a few silver threads among the gold. Those carefree days of youth are gone forever. I walked up the steps, Miss Dolly, this racetrack. My son Judah gave me his shoulder so that my bad knees could make it to the top. My son Josiah scotched me on my way down so that I wouldn't stumble. You've seen me fall off this platform before, breach laying on my belly here. Those of you that are here every Sunday. Uh, so I read this. And I thought to myself, you've got to learn how to regulate your seasons. And you've got to be honest with yourself when seasons come. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. I honored a graduate from a college yesterday in a card. And instead of writing the normal go sick them scriptures, be prosperous scriptures, success scriptures that I normally would do, I wrote Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 5, and I said, learn how to regulate your season. If you knew you were going to get old, this old, this fast, would it have changed anything in your life? Listen, honor and enjoy your creator while you're still young, before the years take their toll and your vigor, vigor wanes. Hold that just a minute. One scripture says, honor and enjoy your creator before the days of trouble come. You think you got trouble being young right now, Sha? You just wait. Trouble coming. Amen. And it comes in all form sizes. Trouble comes. Can I get an amen? Next verse. Next verse. Before your vision dims and the world blurs and the winter years keep you close to the fire, in old age, your body no longer serves you so well. This is that earth suit I've been preaching about for all these years. Muscles slacken, grip weakens, joints stiffen, the shades are pulled down on the world. You can't come and go as you will. Things grind to a halt. The hum of the household fades away. And you're waking now by bird song. Hikes to the mountains are things of the past. Even a stroll down the road has its terrors. Your hair turns apple blossom white, adorned in a fragile and impotent matchstick body. Yes, you're well on your way to eternal rest while your friends make plans for your funeral. Whew. Boy, it's quiet in here. But I have to learn how to regulate and understand my seasons. Amen. And when I read David the word rest there, all of a sudden my theology shifted just a little. Because I've seen so many of y'all write R.I.P. about stuff. And I've always said, there ain't no rest in heaven. When we get to heaven, we're going to be rolling and going, baby. Amen. We're going to be, I mean, it's going to be a snowball for heaven. We're going to be having a lot of fun. I believe that. But I also believe, Charlie, we're finally going to get some rest. Amen. These bodies are finally going to be able to say, Amen, I've made it this far. Now, understanding what I just read, think about Jesus looking down at his mama, knowing she fixing to be all alone. There's nobody going to take care of her like I'm going to take care of her. And then looking at her, she stands at the cross with these two other women and, and John the Apostle, and on the cross, her firstborn son, she watched as they beat him. She heard with the ear of her mother the screams, the cries of agony. She watched her son being tortured to death. She couldn't lift a finger to help or to stop him. She heard the swear words of the crowd. She knew they were lying. She heard the blasphemy. She watched as they walked by and slapped him and beat him and cursed him. She could do nothing about it. And and then his last will and testament. Only those who have watched a loved one pass could understand this. Only those that have seen death take over a body can understand this. She looks at her son, just a shell of a man. He used to be beaten, almost beyond recognition, writhing in pain, and the crowd loving it. You just want to run and slap everybody. And in those hours, suddenly the cry comes from the cross. Jesus looked down, seeing his mother Mary, and sees John standing next to her. Says, "Dear woman." Here's your son. And the other disciple, here's your mama. And from that time on, the disciple took 
her into his home. See, when you understand Jewish tradition, you understand that the dying words of any man or woman are their last will and testament. What they say is everything. So when he said to John, take care of your mama, see, here, here's, here's the hard things about sharing the word of God with people. You, you've got to get into a place in your life where you understand that you are alone because of a lot of your own choices. And to be able to love, to forgive, to care for, to, to pour, and it ain't just blood. But to be able to have a church family that loves you means you reciprocated and you poured into their life. Amen. And when you get to a place in life where you need somebody to take care of you, first of all, let me just tell you, Jesus ain't never going to leave you. Amen. He's going to take care of you. He's going to look at you. But, but then there's us. Amen. Mom, there's, still, there's, there's nothing else. I, I, I can't do anything for you. I mean, I see this in my mind. You, John, 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 you, you, will you be as I was to her? Will you be a son to her in need? John, do you do you see my mama take care of her after I'm gone? Do you do for her what I could not do now, but I only did when I was alive? It's a dying son's request. Amen. As a Jew, he was raised under the law. He knew the fifth commandment. Honor your father and mother. Amen. Honor your father and your mother. And you say, well, what, well what is the truth here, Pastor? The truth is this. Although Jesus was about saving the world, rescuing people and healing people and pulling a thief from a cross to make sure he's going to be with him later, asking everybody else to be forgiven. Even though he was doing all of that, he was never too busy to take care of his mama. Amen. He still, mama meant something. He was being effective all the time. But I draw from this some simple applications. First, no one is ever discharged from this obligation. Honor your mom and your dad. Amen. If our Lord Jesus, hanging in agony, remembered his mother at the end of his life, then so should we. No one here is ever discharged from that. Second, when you can't do anything else for the people you love, you can at least tell them you love them. And in a few minutes, you know what I'll do. I'll get in my car. I'll head down the road. I'll call my mama. Amen. She'll answer that phone, and we'll have a conversation from here to New Caney. We do it every Sunday. Amen. I get to talk with her. I get to ask her the same questions. How's the weather? Did you have your coffee? She'll ask me, how's my week? Amen. And we'll go through a, a dialogue. And then every now and then something, a little morsel will slip in, and it changes everything. You know, that's the good things about life. Do that. That's what Jesus was saying. Mom, I can't come down. They're going to kill me. Amen. I'll be dead soon. Amen. But I love you. And number three, no matter what you do in this life, you can hardly be considered a success if in your rapid climb to the top you neglect to care. For your parents, your guardians, family. If we spend time with them now, hopefully, everybody say hopefully. Hopefully, they'll spend time with us later. Hey, I just, Michael, I just, I told my boys, I said, man, you know, I, you tell me you love me, but I'll know it when I get older if you put an elevator in my deer stand. I'll know then that you love me. You really love your daddy. But I want to tell you, to lean on them boys going up and down them steps and watching them watch after me. I thought to myself, that ain't, that ain't right. That used to be me carrying them up the steps. I told him on my arm. Last time I was at the races, Josiah was five, six years old. I let him cut in line from here to the back door back there just to cut in to get an autograph with John Forrest because nobody could turn Joe down when he was a little boy. Amen. And now they're helping me up and down the steps. My has life changed. Has it turned around? Amen. So regulate, learn how, and figure this out to take care of one another. You know, it's, it's okay. No, no, no. Don't say that. Let me start closing. Give you some action steps here. Don't ever treat your calling as a believer in Christ as a way to negate your responsibilities. And I know, I know everybody in here has got a story. I've met people whose parents were awful. They were terrible. And I've, I've seen divorce hurt children and how it's affected people. And, and they, they look back and and steps, and all of these things. You know, my, I have two stepdaughters, and they both call me Bonus Dad. I don't know if I like that title, Bonus Dad, especially when I'm the one giving the bonuses. Amen, but there's some action steps here. What do you do, and where do you begin? Let me give you some idea. First, if you really want to take this word to heart, go to your parents and tell them you love them. Do it while you got a chance. Second, 
if you can't honor them while they're alive, you can remember them after they pass. Remember them. Remember, remember your mom and dad. Isn't it true that the worst fear that all of us have is that someday we'll depart from this land and people will forget us? We don't want to be forgotten. Amen. We want to be remembered. I remember Donna, your mama, and your grandmama, and your grandpa. Never forget the Havards. Amen. I look down around this church and I see people that used to be here. Your mama was funny. Good woman. Good woman. Your grandma? Crazy. I went to see her in an assisted living place. She realized that they couldn't hold her. She took off running out. She ran from that assisted living place. She took off running. It, it, her mind was slipping. The curtain had come down, just like Ecclesiastes 12 said. The curtain had come down. She took off running. I looked at her and said, Mama Havert, where, where'd you go? She said, I ran as fast as I could out of this place. Got right outside the gate, got tired and sat down and waited on them to come pick me up and bring me back. <laughs> Too tired to go, Brother Havert? Brother Havert, when his mind started slipping, they found him over in Galena Park somewhere. He hitchhiked from the other side of Kennefick to there. Somebody had to find him. They, I was getting phone calls. Anybody seen Brother Havert? Amen. Life began to happen. But you still honored him. And you're honoring them being here today and bringing the kids. Y'all give her a hand. That's important to me. Don't want to be forgotten. And if you are unable to speak good about your parents, guardians, and friends, you can honor them by refusing to speak evil. You can decide not to say nothing at all. Perhaps your parents weren't the best when you needed them. Maybe you don't even know where your father or your mother are. Maybe you were abused, hurt. You say, Pastor, I just can't. I can't, I can't do what you're saying. I accept that. But even if your parents have hurt you, you're not dismissed from the command to honor them. You still honor. Amen. Listen carefully. If you can't do anything else, there's one way you can honor your parents. You can forgive them and refuse to speak evil against them because you're starting this thing over. Amen. You're breaking curses from the past. Amen. You're setting things up for your children and your grandkids. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's what we're doing. This is the gospel, my friend. Sometimes the gospel is a hard message. But to not take care of somebody that you love, the Bible calls you an infidel, an unbeliever. You're telling everybody you're a Christian. You go to church here, there, and other places. You got a Jesus bumper sticker, but you don't care for your parents. you worse than an infidel. Care for those that God gives you care for. Whew. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Spirit of God, thank you for being in this house. Because I can't do this without you. I know the hurts in this house. I know the people that are here, and even those that are watching. I, I know that many have tried and reached. And Some are wondering now, where are my children? Where are my grandkids? Where are those that... I gave so fully to when they were young. I fed them. I looked after them. And now I'm alone. God, I can't cure every problem in America. I can't turn things around. I can't make bad choices good again. But I can ask you to forgive us. Forgive us who don't know what we're doing. I ask you to remember us. Remember us. Help us know what moves your heart. God, help us to be better. Help us just to be better than being parents and grandparents and guardians. God, I stand in your grace because I don't deserve your favor. I don't deserve that love. But the fact that you would turn your mother over to one of your disciples speaks volumes to me because I know she had biological children and yet you saw somebody else that could take care of mama just a little bit better Lord we give you our parents we give you our children with your heads bowed and your eyes closed you say pastor I just want to give my heart to Jesus today I just want to give my heart to Jesus today slip your hand up I just want to give my heart. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, thank you. Just slip your hand up. Let's pray this together. Lord Jesus, today I give you my heart. My prayer is that it moves you. 
that you understand. I'm free will. I can do what I want to do. But today I've decided to serve you, to love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here.